if you would, join us in our call to worship. Oh God, you are our God, and we come to praise you. Your grace goes before us and welcomes us here. Your steadfast love is better than the riches of life. Your grace redeems us, restores us, and offers us new life. In the shadow of your wings, we will sing for joy. Your grace leads us into perfect love. If you would join me in the opening prayer. All merciful, tender God, you have given birth to our world, conceiving and bearing all the lives and breeze. We have come to you as your daughters and sons aware of our aggression and anger, our drive to dominate and manipulate others. We ask you to forgive us and by the gentle embrace of your spirit, help us to find a renewed sense of compassion that we may truly live as your people in service to all. Amen. We're going to go into our Old Testament lesson today, which comes from Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 9. And that reads, Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me, listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the people you shall see you shall call nations that you do not know and nations that do not know you shall run to you because the lord your god the holy one of israel for he has glorified you seek the lord while he may be found call upon him while he is near let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as heaven, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Our gospel lesson will be coming from Luke 13, verses 1 through 9. And that reads, Stand, Stand sorry. <laughs> At that very time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, do you think because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed at the Tower of Siloam, who killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. 
a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. This has been the word of God for the people of God. Oh, 
This is the third Sunday of Lent. It's just the third Sunday of Lent. Last week, Jason said it felt, has felt like Lent has been going on for two years now. <laughs> it's just the third Sunday of Lent. But um, Lent is supposed to kind of feel like this. You know, it's supposed to feel like this. It's supposed to feel like a wilderness journey towards Easter. It's supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be difficult. We're supposed to give things up that will make our life less pleasant. Um, we're supposed to have a difficult season that's rough as burlap. <laughs> and so challenging that we will want to change our ways. So challenging that we'll want to live a different life by the end of it. And so here we are on the third Sunday of Lent. And Jesus in the scripture tells us the theme of Lent, which is to repent, to change, to turn in a new direction, to do something new. Jesus says, repent, he says. To give up the old life, to long for a new life, to turn in a new direction, to do something different, to let go of the past, repent. Jesus says, unless you repent, you will perish. Unless you repent, you will perish. He says it twice in this scripture. Unless you repent, you will perish. It's like a warning for those who are listening that if you don't get your life together, if you don't get your act together, if you don't straighten up and walk right, then you will perish. It feels like the third Sunday of Lent, all right. <laughs> There are people who have come to Jesus who ask him about this horrific event that has happened in the temple. Some Galileans were there to worship, and Pilate's police have come in and killed them while they were sacrificing, worshiping. It was a terrible, terrible event. And they come to ask Jesus, what happened to these Galileans that they deserve this kind of thing? They want to know if this is God's punishment for something that they didn't repent in time, that they didn't change their ways in time. They must be doing something for God to punish them. That's what I often say when bad things happen in life. Why me, O oh Lord? Why are you doing this to me? Why is this happening to me? It is such a common refrain. That when something bad happens, it feels like God's punishing us. That when something horrible happens in the world, it feels like God is trying to get our attention to teach us something. I've asked this a lot of times, especially when I'm late going to work. I run out the door, I get to my car, I realize I left my keys in my house, and that my house is also locked, and that I have no way to get in my car or my house. And I want to pray really loudly in my driveway. Why are you doing this to me, God? Why me? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you've said it too. Like when you've had a horrible day. Nothing goes right. You feel alone, isolated, depressed. Maybe you've prayed that prayer too. Why me, God? Why are you punishing me? Or maybe you've said it beside the bed of someone you love who's been diagnosed with cancer, who has to go undergo treatment that's terrible, and undergo sickness and hair loss and days that are hard. Why, God? Why? Or maybe when a family member dies so unexpectedly without cause or warning, I can understand when someone might say, why are you doing this, God? Why is this happening? Why does it feel like we're being punished? Do we really deserve it? 
If this idea is so ingrained in us, this idea that God is out to get us, that God is punishing us, is so ingrained in us that even when tragedies like 9-11 happen or Hurricane Katrina or the earthquakes in Haiti, the television preachers will get on the air and talk about how God is punishing us so that we might turn and repent and change our ways, that we might learn a lesson. This is so ingrained and prevalent in our society and lives that any kind of trouble, any kind of sorrow, any kind of sickness, any kind of heartache that comes our way just seems like a sign that God is trying to teach us a lesson. And maybe, maybe we deserve it. It's common throughout the Bible. I mean, if you should read through the Bible, the Psalms over and over again will complain to God, why are you doing this to me? Why have you forgotten me, O God? Why do I deserve this? When Job lost his family and all of his possessions, his friends came to ask him, Job, what'd you do to deserve this? You must have done something, so you better ask God to forgive you. (laughs) You probably deserved it, so you better ask you must repent. Even when Jesus' own disciples came to him and, and came upon a blind man who's been blind since birth, the, the, the disciples asked Jesus, whose fault is it? Who sinned to make this blind man blind? Was it the man? Was it his parents? Who is to blame? Even his own disciples believe that the man's blindness is some kind of punishment from God for a sin that has been committed. Here we are in our scripture today where some people come asking the same question. Jesus, what about those Galileans who were slaughtered by Pilate at the temple? Did they deserve this? And Jesus says with an emphatic no. No, this is not of God, Jesus says. This is not God's doing. This is not God. Would, what God would do. This did not happen for a reason. This is, did not happen for God to punish them. You think they're worse sinners than anybody else? <laughs> Jesus says. They did not deserve it. It's not God's doing. And to drive his point home, he even brings up another terrible event that has happened in the community where a tower has fallen on some people and killed them. And he says, well, if you even, do you even think they were worse off than anyone else? No, Jesus says, this is not God's punishment. God does not punish us in that way. They did not deserve it. They did not deserve it. God does not work this way. God does not hide our keys and lock us out of our house. God does not inflict cancer upon our bodies so we might learn a lesson. God does not take lives of loved ones around us because somehow they deserved it. God does not do this kind of work. God does not cause the pain and suffering to make us learn a lesson. Jesus says, no. As my friend Paul says, God does not punish us for being human. Because being human means we're fragile and we're frail and life is not perfect and oftentimes it's full of sorrow and sadness and sickness and pain and it just is. Because sin is evident in our lives and people make mistakes and sometimes we make them ourselves and it's just a part of a broken system and world. But as terrible as it is and terrible as it can be, God does not punish us with these things. This is not God's punishment for things we might think we deserve. And you know, I believe this with all my heart. I believe it with all of my being. I believe it with all the faith I have. (laughs) I believe it. I believe God does not operate like Santa Claus. I believe God does not operate like Santa Claus, dishing out presents to those who are good and coal to those who are bad, giving rewards to those who think are good and punishing those we think who are bad. God does not operate like this. The God of love, the God of grace, the God of Jesus Christ does not work like this. I believe this with all of my heart. But it's so pervasive. I really have to be honest with you. I I hope you'll let me be honest with you. 
Because as much as I believe these calamities and tragedies and illnesses of the world are not God's way of punishing us, sometimes I think it might be. Especially when bad things happen to people I don't like. <laughs> you know? <laughs> when somebody who is a terrible person that just grates on my nerves, that I cannot stand, when that person does something that messes them up, maybe they trip or fall in front of people and they look embarrassed and humiliated, like, <laughs> it's God getting back at you, <laughs> you know? <laughs> When someone who is like narcissistic and egotistical and hateful towards others and they begin to walk around and, and they have uh, toilet paper stuck to their shoe, like, ah, that's a good one, God. <laughs> God's getting you back, you know. <laughs> oh, this past month, the Florida legislature passed the Do Not Say Gay bill that seems to be more political theater than anything, but mostly hatefulness towards the LGBTQ community. This past week, this past week, my friends, the... Um, the guy that wrote that legislation had his home damaged by a tornado. God's getting you back. You know? <laughs> Even a guy on Twitter who, who responded to that event, the guy on Twitter said, I'm not a believer, but after this I might be. This idea that bad things happen because God is getting back at us or punishing us for a sin is so pervasive that even the unbelievers believe it. <laughs> oh, man. And as much as I don't want to believe it, it just resides in my life like a stain that won't go away. It's in the air. It's in our theology. And because maybe that's how we think the world should work, Maybe that's because we think that's the way it should be. Because maybe that's how we would act if we were God. Getting back at those who we hate, can't stand. But Jesus says here, no, this is not of God. This isn't how God works. And unless you repent, you will perish. Repent, Jesus says. Repent. Maybe, maybe what Jesus is trying to tell us to repent of is this whole idea that God's going to get us. This whole idea that God is punishing us, that the things that are calamities and terribles and tragedies in our life are God's way of punishing us. Maybe Jesus is saying to us, repent of this whole idea. You think the Galileans deserved it? You think those killed by the tower were punished worse than anyone else? No, God, Jesus says, repent. Repent from this whole idea altogether. Repent from this idea that God is out to get you. Repent from this idea that God is causing the tragedy in your life to teach you a lesson. Repent from the idea that God is causing you sorrow, heartache, pain, cancer, loss, grief. Repent. Turn away. Go in a new direction. Because if we don't turn away from this theological nightmare, we will perish. The word perish means to become lost, to become marred, to be destroyed. And if we don't repent, we will perish because we will become lost in our own hate and anger and bitterness we will become marred by our own desire for revenge. We will be destroyed by our own inability to forgive. If we don't repent, we will perish. And then Jesus makes his point even stronger. He tells a parable about this fig tree that isn't producing any fruit. The landowner wants to cut it down. It's worthless. It hasn't done anything for the past three years. No good fruit has come of it. The gardener comes along and says, no, 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 let me take care of it. Let me get one more year. And the gardener comes and tends to it, putting manure around it, waters it, cares for it. He says, after the year's up, if there's no fruit, okay, fine, then you can cut it down. But let me give it another chance. Let me give it another year. Give it more time over and over again. Let me give it more grace, more love, forgiveness, more time. 
And if the tree doesn't produce any good fruit when the year is over, okay, then you can cut it down, fine, sure. There's no end to the story. We don't know if the tree produces fruit or not. But I can imagine that if a gardener had taken that much care, that much love, that much grace, (laughs) that I can imagine that tree will produce fruit in abundance. And I think maybe that's the point. That to repent of our belief that God is seeking out to punish us and destroy us, to repent of that and instead see God as the gardener who wants to save us, nurture us, redeem us, and sustain us with tender love and care. Maybe we're called to turn away from this idea of the world that wants people to get what they deserve and turn towards the idea that the undeserving receive much more grace and love, forgiveness, compassion. And the idea is that we're changed, not by revenge or destruction, but by love. That we're not changed by hatefulness, but that we're nurtured by forgiveness. That we're never completely too far lost for we have given opportunity to change and to grow into new life over and over again. And maybe if we see God this way, if we see ourselves this way, if we see that we're loved this way, then maybe we ourselves might produce the good fruit of repentance that Jesus is nurturing in us, the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, patience, Forgiveness, kindness, faithfulness, self-control. The fruit of the Spirit of God that calls us to nurture us, to love others, and to see ourselves loved. To offer forgiveness to others and to maybe even forgive ourselves. To care for others in this world and to love even our enemies. Because revenge and hate will not transform or change us. Only love. This is the fruit of the Spirit. This is the way of repentance. Nurtured by God. Who loves us so much that he sent his only begotten son into this world. So that we might not perish but have everlasting life. Life. Life is what God wants for us. Life is what God wants for the world. Even in this season of Lent. Some people say that because you have stayed that you will get all you have earned. Some people say that because you never run away that you should get all you deserve. Sometimes, sometimes love, sometimes, sometimes love shines like the stars. 
And sometimes, sometimes love, sometimes, sometimes love shines like a broken heart. God of all forsaken people, stick a claim and raise your steeple. Break your heart over me. God of all the poor and weary, maybe one day I'll see clearly if you will hang your star over me. Hang your star over me. Some people say that because you've run away that you will get all you deserve. Some people say that because you are what they hate that you will get all you have earned. But sometimes, sometimes love, sometimes, sometimes love shines just like the stars. But sometimes, sometimes love, sometimes, sometimes love shines like a broken heart. God of all forsaken people, take a claim and raise your steeple. Break your heart over me. God of all the poor and weary, maybe one day I'll see clearly if you will hang your star over me. Hang your star. over me if I only get what I want to get if I only love what I want to love then I'll never get anything out of love if I only get what I want to get if I only love what I want to love then I'll never get everything out of love. If I only get what I want to get, if I only love what I want to love, then I'll never get everything out of love. God of all forsaken people, take a claim and raise your steeple. Break your heart. God of all the poor and weary, maybe one day I'll see clearly if you will hang your star over me. Hang your star. Hang your star. Hang your star over me. join together in a word of prayer. O holy and gracious God, we do come to you during the season of Lent, seeking ways of renewal for our lives. We know, God, that in some parts of our hearts and in our world that cobwebs have grown and lights have grown dim. 
Allow us to clean and to see and to hear your words of light and love and living once again. Speak to us, O God, and renew our hope and trust in you. Help us to claim again those words in baptism that we are claimed as part of your family through your spirit and in powers of evil have cannot triumph over us. Help us, O God, to live out these promises, these words of hope, this love and light into the world. Gracious God, we pray for the world around us, especially this day, O God, we pray for the war in Ukraine. We pray, O God, from those who are experiencing constant bombardment and hunger, dehydration, suffering, been deported to all parts of Russia, just horrifying words of tragedy. But, oh God, spend your angels and your spirit's presence to be with them, to guide them, protect them. Oh God, grant we do pray, oh Lord, as you tell us to do for our enemies. We pray, oh God, for Russia and for a change of heart. Good God, I believe even you can change Putin. May it be so that a renewal of love and life will take place there too. Oh, gracious gracious God, bring about peace and help us to do it as best we can through our prayers, fervent gifts of resources and munitions to fight an aggressor. Guide our president, Joe, and all the world leaders as they work to bring about peace. Help them care for others. Gracious God, we pray for our church, our Mother Methodist Church that guides and directs us as it continues to experience the uncertainty of the future. We pray, O oh God, for your light and love to grow and it, that we may be a beacon of hope and love for your world, that all people may be welcome, and that we may serve to live out your call upon us, your church, in the world. Strengthen its leaders, especially our Bishop Ken and District Superintendent Bev in these days. We pray, O oh God, for West North Carolina Cabinet as they meet this week to make appointments for next year all across our conference. We pray for your wisdom and your strength and your presence. And pray, God, we pray for our church as we meet Monday night as our church council and continue to make decisions and to look forward the future and seek your direction and call upon us and our ministry. Oh, gracious God, in this time of Lent, we especially pray for ourselves. We pray, O oh God, that you're growing in us and through us into the world to strengthen us on days in which we're weariest and tired and worn out, to allow us to hear your love in our lives your grace shed and given for us and the life that we're called to live in the world. Help us, O oh God, to be your people, to model our life after Jesus, to be able to be in ministry with one another and those around us. Help us to see your Spirit growing every day in and through our lives and help us to grow closer to Him. Gracious God, especially we give you thanks for the prayer in which Jesus taught his disciples to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is a kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Hello, my name is Jason Harvey, and I serve here by being lucky enough to be your pastor, so I appreciate that. We are honored to have you worship with us on College Place, both in person and online. If it's your first time with us, fill out the visitor cards uh, that we might get you connected to College Place. Sunday Night Live will meet uh, tonight at 7 in the sanctuary. It's a join, uh, you're welcome to join for contemporary worship and communion service. Uh, the Sunday morning Bible study is in the fellowship hall on Sunday mornings. If you'd like to know more about that, talk to Robert. For Lent, we have these little uh, devotionals that are still around, and we're getting closer to the end of Lent, but there are a few still around. If you haven't done that or would like to strengthen your walk during that season, um, there's some of those are available, or you can come and get this one. Uh, listening cir- circles are continuing this Thursday. Uh, if you've signed up, remember your time. Uh, if you, uh, we're also continuing to accept uh, Ukrainian relief uh, gifts in, through UNCOR, United Methodist Committee on Relief. They're already at work in, in Ukraine. So we pray for them and uh, invite you to worship and to give that. You can either give it through the church or you can give online uh, following links in the newsletter and such. Uh, church Council will meet uh, Monday night at 6.30 in person and online. Uh, and the other thing that I... Uh, want to add is, speaking of online, uh, go this week and check out the College Place website. Uh, we, thanks to Andrew's hard work this week, uh, I'll go ahead and let you claim it. Uh, <laughs> it looks really good. It looks so much better, and it's not teal. Um, our old one was. So um, that's a little menu bar at the bottom. That's a, just a screenshot I took from my phone, but uh, the online on your desktop is much larger, uh, uh, but it's, it's really cool, and our sermon links Sermons links will go right up to there, and so you can. And on the very bottom of that page, there's a little uh, listen live. So if you hadn't figured that out, if you're here today and hadn't figured that out at home, you can go all the way down. There's a little YouTube logo, and you click on it, and it takes you to our page. So if you can't sleep at night, Fred, you can go back and listen to any of my sermons. <laughs> but I do appreciate that. That's a lot of hard work, and I don't know how to do it. So I appreciate people who do. Each week we worship together and seek ways to serve God in this community. We now have the opportunity to give to God part of what God has given to us as we support our ministry together. You're invited to give in the offering plates or at the church entrances. You can also give online or through a QR code if you want to be really trendy and figure out how to do that. Uh, And uh, click the donation button on our new website. uh, Or you may mail a check or drop it off at the office. Thank you for supporting the ministry of College Place. Let us pray together. Holy, gracious God, we do give you thanks that you have called us into ministry and through our baptism in our world. We ask, O oh God, that you receive the gifts that we offer, multiply them to change your world and to, and to affect it in a, in a way in which uh, brings you honor and glory. We ask, O oh God, these things in your Son's name we pray. Amen. I'll invite you and let us stand together and affirm our faith using the statement of faith of the United Church of Canada. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, and life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.
this season of Lent, my friends, repent. Not out of fear, but because you're loved, forgiven, and set free towards new life. May you go in that love and life. May the God who created you, sustains you, and redeems you be with you now and forever. Go in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May you go in peace. Amen.